you can make HR policies, you can make HR processes, or you could do it at a societal level with laws. But if you don't deal with the humans and the emotions inside of that, lots of stuff isn't going to change. And that people have to want to know how to. I guess I just think, maybe this is my upbringing of being brought up to believe that I could have a voice, is I just think everyone should have a voice and everyone should be heard. No one is entirely right. You know, everyone just sees a part of it. It was really hard for people to be able to listen because they were so restricted by rules or regulations that were self-imposed or by their institution that they, they stymied people's ability to have their voice. Welcome to another episode of Everyday Leadership. Today, I have a very good friend who I had just given heart attack to by asking her to introduce herself. You know, I like to keep people a little on their towels and switch things up. And that goes for my guest as well. So, Alice Evans, can you introduce yourself? Who, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really, really did give me a heart attack. Uh, it's a good job I don't have a pacemaker in me. Uh, who am I? I am a Brit who lives in Amsterdam. I am a parent of two, teenager, almost teenager. And I like to think I'm really funny. <laughs> And I'm not, but I do do improv. And I, in my, in my working life, I am a team coach and work around complexity and systems. And in the past, I've been a deputy chief exec of a charitable foundation. I'm also currently a visiting fellow at the Oxford University's Skoll Centre for Social Innovation. But most importantly, I'm trying to enjoy life. And that is, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. It was a very nice, short summary. Leader, you what makes you, what's the things that are important to you? Um, I would add, she's also the upcoming host of the amazing podcast, Pleasuring Myself, that we're going to talk about today. You know, you know, I, I, I know your wife, you want to think around that. What? Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll, delve, we'll delve into the title, but she's she's the upcoming host of that amazing, amazing, amazing podcast. And even though she downplayed it, she is a highly sought after exec coach, facilitator, working with teams across all levels, frontline exec, middle management. Uh, absolutely amazing individual who knows a lot and has been involved in so much. And with that in mind, um, there's probably only two questions I consistently ask on the podcast. One is around your childhood. And I'm going to go for what was a young Alice like at nine years old? So I have two halves of who Alice was like at nine years old because my mum died when I was nine. Um, but if I go from slightly before that, I think I was a slightly precocious nine year, uh, eight, seven, eight year old because my mum comes from a lineage of really, really amazing women. So we discovered recently that my great, great aunt was a explorer and she was, I think the first white woman to climb Kilimanjaro. So, and my granny was like the first woman to become a permanent undersecretary at the treasury. So I had these like really high powered women, but they were all part of my life. So we'd go to my granny's house and I'd be playing like boggle or scrabble with uh, Cambridge professors <laughs> but I wouldn't know they were Cambridge professors and they would just treat me as adult so I was incredibly used to being treated as an adult by people so I had this expectation that I could have a voice and that I would be listened to and I'd be spoken to and I was having a lovely time so my childhood was full of I don't know I think it was quite a unique childhood in that way and then my mum died and so we just changed from when I was nine onwards because we just adjusted to living with my dad and three children and it, uh, yeah but there was loads of love in my childhood loads of love how did it affect me I really tried to think about this I think most people's normalness is like debility that so when change happens to them it can be feeling really frightening or it can feel really different whereas I think 
because your pattern can get formed when you're between eight and ten I think one of the things that happened to me was that mm. living with uncertainty living with complexity just became my normal so it feels very very normal to me to live like that so I think I think how it changed me is like I, I grew up really quickly I just became an adult and I was quite a wild teenager but I I had I think that's how it changed me I think it gave me in a sense a really good schooling in how to live with uncertainty and complexity they say you're a wild teenager how wild was wild <laughs> I think there was a moment where I could have really gone <laughs> the wrong way <laughs> um, but I didn't I didn't I, I, I did have my first clubbing experience when I was 13 and I did lots of stuff like that but uh, yeah I was actually then a very sensible teenager in my later years I think I just compacted it into my early teenage years I did. I did. I made a choice. It's like, if I carry on down this route, it's not going to end well. And actually, I don't want to do that to my dad. So I made a choice to... It's still to a very like, and... logical choice, I ain't going to lie, because a lot of teenagers aren't thinking that way. It's like, I'm young, I'm going to experience myself, and then I live life. So there must have been something there for you to actually just stop and think and be like, actually, let me go down a different path. Yeah, yeah. I think this is what I mean about how I grew up really quickly. So I think in, in many senses, I skipped lots of the aspects that you might do as a teenager because I had to take a lot of responsibility for myself. I had to look after myself. I mean, my dad was amazing, absolutely amazing, but he was still a, he was still coping with his own grief. So I you had to just grow up and, and do with stuff. And my younger brother was four when my mum died, so... So, he, you know, we were just we were just in transition, I think, through that time. You grew up, sensible teenager. What was the next? <laughs> I don't want to which one, which one is calling it what it is. I like you being sensible. I really like dancing. <laughs> I was going to say, then what was it around as you were growing up and going through that then? Like, before we, we talked, you're talking about, like, teaching mums at 18 English. Like... Was there a plan that you had from a young age? Because sometimes kids were like, oh, I want to do X, Y, Z when I grow up. Did you ever have any of those plans for yourself or was it consistently changing and you just go on the flow? I was going to be an international commercial lawyer what? at one point, Chopin. That's so, you know what, that's so <laughs> out there. Yeah, from... <laughs> Actually, yeah. it's, like it's not, it's... well, think about it again. It's not too far from... Some of what you did with Lancelot like, Chase in in a in a sense, in a sense, if I was to kind of squint really really hard and think about it, but that is no, I don't I don't see that. I know. I could have. I would have been a terrible, a terrible lawyer because you have to have attention to detail, and I love looking at the big picture and seeing how everything knits together. Like it, it just wouldn't have worked. And anyway, I was going to be that. So then I did work experience <laughs> and I did work experience with a barrister and uh, I got asked out by the person that was <laughs> prosecuting at one point. Wait, did you say yes? I said, no, of course I did. I was like, what? why are you asking me that? Anyway, so, so then I was like, okay, I want to go. I really want to go into international development. Like, like the love of travel was like, was the driving factor between the international commercial lawyer. I was never going to be a good commercial lawyer. And I went away to India. Uh, you know, as a nice 18 year old white girl to go and change the world in India and got there and realized I was incredibly arrogant. I couldn't believe I thought that. But while we were there, so that career path ended straight away. But while we were there, I met a whole load of Thai monks and they were all over in India doing their PhDs and we introduced ourselves and then we went every day to go and help them with their PhDs and teach them English. And it was a lot of fun. When you went across initially, and how long did it take for you to realize that, to your point, like that was a very arrogant way of thinking when you went in there? And what was it that really changed your mind? The first thing that they said was, you know, you'll be going to an area that, you know, there's poverty. And I, my definition of poverty was, I can't remember, but it was something really naive. And then I got there and there was no glass in the windows and, I, and the floor was with mud. 
in this kind of, you know, like compacted soil as to how some of the stuff was done. But, oh my God, I was so naive and so, so UK centric and, and like global North centric in my viewpoint. This, how could I possibly have believed that? And then I got there and then we messed up because we treated everyone as equal. And there's a caste system and we didn't realize that caste system. And, and it was just, there were all these moments where I was just like, I can't, I cannot believe that I had this naivety and this belief that I could do this. So I, we stuck it out for four months and then I was just, uh, I was just like, like that, that's it. That career is over. I'm not going to do that. How can I possibly go and tell another country how to live their life? But the UK has so much inequality and poverty of its own. Like, you can't do that. So that was that was it. Which was, you know, it was really good to learn that early on. Yeah. I guess. I was having this conversation recently, so I was interested to hear your take. When you think about some of what shaped your, your mindset, your mentality, especially at that young age around how you saw poverty, inequality, and different things like that. Do you think a lot of that comes down to, from other images on, on TV, a lot of the, the aid appeal, all that kind of stuff that we see a lot on UK TVs? Was that what that shaped that, or was that shaping just society in general? Shaped my views on it. Well, I think my parents, I think my parents were really clear that that I, I had I I had certain aspects of privilege, and that part of my duty. And having some of those aspects of privilege was to was to use them for other people and to use them to to lift up others alongside it, not to use it to make my to to, to yeah, they were just really clear that it was about not just my responsibility to myself but my responsibility to society and we no they were part of a whole food cooperative that we would buy whole food and we had C and D stickers at home, so it was just it was just really part of the warp and weft, I think, of our family that that's how you lived, and I think that just really shaped it. It really shaped it. I went to private school till I was sixteen, and and then I withdrew because I was like, things aren't going to change if parents like myself, like mine or my dad, don't get involved in the education system because we're opting out of something. So I went back to state school. I, I don't know how it shaped it, but it, there was obviously really strong upbringing from my parents. It was interesting when I, I hear you, you say that when you're making that decision at 16 and then I look at the path you kind of went down, which is around doing a work around homelessness um, and policy for years before you obviously went um, into Lan Kelly Chase. Like there's something around from that young Alice, that thread has kind of stayed all the way through of around like equity, inequality, and fighting for that. That's really, really strong in the way that you kind of see like. Yeah, I think it is. I think, I think it is. And I, I, I think it, it yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how what else to say, but yes. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was going to go into frontline homelessness, but then I realised I was terrible with I, I, I was working in a hostel and uh, this guy had an epileptic fit and fell on the floor and smashed his head open <laughs> and had blood coming out of his head and I was on the walkie-talkie having to get all this sorted out and I just said, I just don't have the skills for this. I can't do that. But what I can do is really articulate stuff. So I went into policy and research and around that because that's what I could do. What some of the learnings and lessons that you... You took away from that time and period, including from the work you did at Black Kelly Chase. <laughs> That's no small question. I don't, I don't ask small questions. Chase. That's not what we're here for, you know. I'm going to ask the big questions. That's, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to just buy time and space. I think that one of the things I took away from it was that that when you work in social justice or you're working in this stuff, there's like there's a good and a bad person. And like, and actually, I don't, I don't know if I believe that anymore. I think what I learned was that everyone is trying to do a good job, and and they're trying to do their best, but sometimes they might not be doing it skillfully. The institutions or the structures they're in might be limiting them, 
So how do you how do you get into conversation and dialogue? How do you bring different groups together? How do you help people to have the conversations they need to have that they find difficult so that you can start to to build and learn together? Because we're all interconnected and we're all interdependent. So how do you do that? I think was one of the key things I took away from it. The other was that you can do all of these processes, you can do all of these changes in in how, I don't know, even how an organisation runs, you can make HR policies, you can make HR processes, or you could do it at a societal level with laws. But if you don't deal with the humans and the emotions inside of that, lots of stuff isn't going to change. And that people have to want to know how to and feel free to, like they need an authorising environment to make a change. So I think that was something else I took from it. I think I have a very positive view on people. <laughs> Then they will, they just want to be loved, I think, most people. I guess I just think, maybe this is my upbringing of being brought up to believe that I could have a voice, is I just think everyone should have a voice and everyone should be heard. No one is entirely right. You know, everyone just sees a part of it. I think, I think across all of society, people don't own their rank. They don't own the position they hold. And, and one of the things I realise, especially as a funder, is if you don't own your position and your rank as a funder, then you are partly not allowing other people to own their rank because because they can't then be in true relationship with you. And then you can't truly collaborate. So if you're always apologetic or embarrassed about it, then they almost have to become embarrassed and apologetic about the fact that they're asking for money to do the work they're doing. Like It becomes a really paternalistic approach to stuff and that just doesn't make sense to me when you think well everyone's trying to do the best they can well do you think part of the reason why some people might if i was to flip it the other way around so in my business example some of the people you're working with when you uh do some of the work in, in homeless projects or even some of the people you've seen come across you like my land Cody, they don't always recognize the the power or think they have any whatsoever um i mean if I was to flip you around a completely different lens, even as, as a black person sometimes in the UK is like getting people to think, no, you do have power. You do have status. You do have like, it's, it's not easy to do because of the system, all the masses, mass racism, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's an element to it. But it's even to your point, um, when you mentioned earlier on, there is a lens and review that people still have of other races, other communities. Um, and as I always see someone homeless in the street, I just straight away go to an assumption that those different things are at play and therefore you can, you can easily subjugate yourself and rather than thinking, I do have power in, the, in this, how have you, have you seen that? And how have you, I guess, helped to shape other people's views and perspective of how they view themselves? <laughs> all the time. I see it all the time. And, it, and, and like, you can see it in the tourism sector, but I think you see it in businesses. You see it across all of it. Like, everyone has a story that they they don't have power, that they don't have this. And I think when you are, you know, when you're a black man or when you're a black woman, lesbian, you know, these things stack up to work against you. And yet you hold power. Like, the the one of the things that one charity who we used to fund really taught me was that one of the things they had was that the people who didn't engage in their services were using their power to give them a message because they weren't engaging in the services so it was their job to think how do I listen to that to go out and do it and I was like I had never thought about it that way that people were exercising their power by removing so how do you then have the ability to listen the thing I noticed was it was really hard for people to be able to listen because they were so restricted by rules or regulations that were self-imposed or by their institution that they, they stymied people's ability to have their voice. So the thing I was like as a funder was, okay, so how do I, how do I create platforms so we can lift people up? How do we create those opportunities for people to have voice? So we gave our Twitter account over to people every Friday so they could tweet from our account because as a funder you had an air of respectability so you're like how do we lend that respectability to someone else so you can do it because because I yeah I think it's really hard as an individual but collectively you can do so much more 
Power Sun power Sun power team work. Well, it's a power, but it's but it goes <laughs> back into your point around rather than thinking really really narrow, thinking really broad. Like that's systematic thinking that you are known for and you're good at doing. That is it. That's thinking outside the box. I think a lot of times people just think in small confinement. You know, what, what is it we can do? How can we actually listen? What's going on at play here? Why people aren't tapping into that? At times when there's like there's ignorance, like, all right, it's really we could not use it. That's something in it. Like we've provided it, but actually stop and be like, no, what is going on here? Why are people not tapping into it? What can we create? That's that's so different. And that's a, a systematic thinking. It is. And I I think also like there were some painful moments for me. Very back. You know, like painful where the way we'd structured some of the funding as a funder, we were implicitly racist in that because we weren't structuring it in a way that people who were running groups that were serving black and black communities, they won't get the funding because they didn't meet with the criteria. But so we had to really look at what we were doing and go, oh my God, we, we seriously made a mistake there and how do we then put that right? Or there was another point where we were doing this work and in an area and I I invited another funder along, but I didn't check with the rest of the group whether they wanted that. And they were like, Alice, what have you done? We don't want that funder and you should have asked us. Oh my God, you're so right. I'm so sorry. Let me go and put that right. We made some serious mistakes and I think how to really own that and go, okay, that was a mistake. Let's change it. Was it was really important. And then how do we make, how do we repair that afterwards? Just say you're very, you have a high level of self awareness. <laughs> I don't know. Depends on which day you get me. <laughs> I think you'll have a high level of self awareness. And the thing I've noticed is that if I don't feel that I'm in a safe environment, it's difficult for me to, you know, when you can feel trapped, then you can feel constrained and then it's difficult to be the best of who I want to be. Uh, I mean, I suppose my first instinct might be to lash out and then it'd be like, oh God, what have I just done? The thing I know is that if I'm not continually learning, then I can become, if you go back to, I need uncertainty and complexity and change if I'm not continually learning then I can become very staid and that's where the issues arise so the way I deal with it is to to continually be in reflection and think about stuff because that's what I need your need for uncertainty complexity and change make you live your life your first 40 years in particular in very very interesting um, personally inspiring kind of way um, and I want to talk about the why behind that um, if you're if you're going to talk about that like what was it around the first four years of your life that you approached things in a very very different way yeah I mean I wanted to have so much fun for the first 40 years of my life but I think I also lived every day as if I could die because written on the front of my medical notes was she has a family history of cancer like check it out and can't quite remember but it was scrawled across the front of my medical notes so every time I went to the doctor they would say you know you've got a family history of cancer and I'm like yes I know I've got a family history of cancer you know you could get cancer yes I know I could get cancer my mum died at 40 my aunt died at 36 my granny died when she was in her 60s other members of my family had died so I was part of a research program about hereditary cancer and it was before they could test whether or not you had cancer and whether you had the gene or not. So I just assumed I would get cancer and if I got cancer, I would die. Like that's just, that was kind of a core assumption I lived by. So well, I might as well just enjoy it then. <laughs> like I might as well just enjoy what's going to happen. And I'm 45 and I'm alive. So my assumption was wrong. <laughs> well, your approach, your pro I don't think but, your approach was though. Because you know, that's still like, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy life. Whoever comes, comes, but I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I am. I have. I just immensely enjoyed life. And then I was given the privilege of being tested for the cancer gene. I had it. I had the cancer gene. I had operations. And now I've dramatically reduced my risk. So I, I, I figure that I've just been given some great gifts by 
life. I think that speaks into the character as well, because there are other people who's like, oh, that he is super, super cautious and super, super careful um, about how I approach things. He was like, okay, let me just live it. Live it to the max, enjoy it, move, and have a great life. And all that value sort of comes on, I gave it all, and you've, you've done that, and there's so much more to come. And speaking of so much more to come, let's talk about pleasure in myself. Honestly, that title makes me laugh every single time I say it. So if I just explain it, so when I turned 40 and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to live for another 80 years, I started to live a really safe life. And it was really interesting. I started to live a really safe life. So, and then I was like, oh, this is just not me. And we moved and, and then I left like Kelly and I went and became a systems coach and a team coach and executive coach for all time, which I love. But the, that was all in service of how to nudge and how to live the mouse fully and deeply every day. Because that's what I decided I really wanted to get back to. And I wanted to get back to being a bit more reckless. Because I quite nudge taking risks. And, and over the course of that last year, I was really looking into, well, what does it mean to really have pleasure and joy in my life daily? What does it mean to laugh? Um, and... And then as I was reflecting on the year, I realized a whole load of women were sort of sending me messages about, you know, oh, I've got this, I'm doing this now, da, da, da. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, but why are you telling me? <laughs> and I was like, that's delightful. And like, Alice, you asked me a question. You asked me this question back in the summer. What do you do for yourself that is entirely for yourself without any other purpose than just enjoying it and having pleasure and fun? And it really made me stop in my tracks. It really made me think. And since then, I've done this, this, this. And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And I was like, I'm still learning how to have pleasure and joy in my life. I don't know how to do this. This is like the work ethic is strong inside me to 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 serve other people. So what would it look like? I, thought, I know I'm just going to go and interview a whole load of women about what brings them pleasure and joy. And I'm going to call my podcast Pleasuring Myself. <laughs> uh, and I I will learn. So through every conversation I have with someone, I'm going to learn about what it means to have pleasure and joy. And and I, yeah, that's where it came from. What are, I know you say you're still, you're still figuring it out, but I'm going to ask you, what are your top five ways of pleasuring yourself? That just sounds so sexual, doesn't it? What someone says it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's top a, five it's ways of pleasuring myself. Lush, you know, because I just feel like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! What just amuses me so much. Um, I realise that uh, like serendipitous moments really, really, really bring me pleasure and joy. Like when I bump into someone on the street and talk to them or when something just happens really spontaneously, I just love that. I also love the sound of rain on the rooftop. Like that sound of rain when I'm warm and inside is just gorgeous. And I love the sun on my face. And I just love, love laughing. I really love laughing and I love humour. I love when people are really funny and just really enjoying that. I love, I, should, I mean, I just love thinking about food, making food. I really love eating food. I, I, I love a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff brings me pleasure and joy, I think. The list is so. I think a lot of times I'm like, you, you go to this big, wild things, but your list is very simple. And the reason why that's, I think that's when that's important is actually there are a lot of, there's sometimes the smallest, simplest things that can bring us joy and pleasure. And we tend to go for the big, extraordinary. Like, actually, you know what? Those are fleeting moments. The things that really, really stay with us are some of those small things that you just kind of described. Yeah, and I think that's so. One of the things that I'm asking people for this podcast, and I will ask them, is like, what are fifty things that you enjoy every single day to do? Or like, fifty really is a really long list. 
it's a really long list. And what I've discovered is by the time you get to the end of the list is when they really discover something new. So it really, really makes them think. And, uh, and 50 is deliberate because you really, it's a real reframe of how you look at most of your everyday things. So you just look at it and go, oh, wow, I actually really enjoy doing that. But I don't pause. <laughs> I think I enjoy doing that. I just get on with it. There's a power to pause and reflection. To really take it, take it in. Oh, it was interesting. It's been it's been in the UK for the last couple of days, and like last just day evening, I finished and went into the house. My wife was in the snug, and we're looking outside. And if there was like nine o'clock at night or something like that, it was. I think because of the snow, it looked very very bright outside, and we just chilled there for like half an hour, just like holding hands, just chilling, and it was so peaceful. It was one of those moments that was just the affairs really, really stable. You know, I was like, actually, we didn't, we didn't do anything. We just chilled. I think we were talking, holding hands. She fell asleep eventually. But it was such a nice, beautiful moment just looking out at the white snow, looking out at the world that looked like it was still bright and sunny when it wasn't. It was just some of those simple things like that just bring you so much joy and peace. Yeah. But what, what was it about it? Was it big with your wife was it looking out of the snow big in the warm looking out of the snow what was it that really it was gave a you the pleasure both both being being with my wife um looking out and it just looked it looked so beautiful outside it looked so tranquil outside um and it just gave you a moment of where your mind wasn't racing about different things you were able just to just calm it down and be in the moment and be present in that moment. And I think a lot of times we, some of the lives that we live, we're going for a head to there to do this. To your point around not slowing down and reflecting, that for me was just, it's just pause and just be. And that's what it was that was really, really powerful and um, really joyful and give you a sense of gratitude. That you can actually even do that. Um, that's what it was. I'm, I'm actually sitting there with you. I hope you don't mind right now in my mind. <laughs> just looking out over this now. It just, I don't know. It just, it just makes, it makes your body feel calm. Some of these moments, like it, it really gets you back, I think, to some of your body. Yeah. Stuff. And it's, um, a lot of work that we both do. It's just where you go and you're talking to some of the, high performing senior leaders and you're like just we're gonna slow things down for a bit and they're like what well, how's that gonna help me do you know what i'm going through i'm thinking about this and this and this and it's a bit this is about this we're just gonna slow things down it's like how and then you have something you do something with them around their bodies and connecting and they feel so transformed after like a short period of time of just being and being present it doesn't get a lot of a lot of um, props that it needs to. It's not talked about a lot more, to be honest. It needs to be talked about a lot more. <laughs> I know. I think it does. And I think I think it's really hard because you've got so much. When you're really, like, captured by this great, great busyness, which can feel so real when you're in it, that your adrenaline is just coursing through your body. I don't know. And all the parasympathetic or the sympathetic, I never quite can remember the words. But... um. But then when you stop, it takes quite a time for your body to restabilize, I think, as well. Is that something of the complex and chaotic world that we live in, where we've been so programmed to consistently be another goal, that slowing down and, and is hard for us to do? Or is it just, is that the story that we tell ourselves to make us feel better about not doing it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> How would you answer that question? <laughs> basically, based on your vast experience, you know, what, what, what have you seen? What's your opinion at this? That's what I want to know. You know? <laughs> I think, I think we are driven by a desire to be productive and to produce and to, to achieve and to move to the next thing. And I think it's, it's really driven by this kind of survival instinct and and I think it can be really scary to slow down like when I resigned and left and I knew I was going to do all this stuff I was having to go am I going to be okay with that when I 
will I earn? Will I survive? Will that be okay? And I, and, and I had to really look at, well, what does it mean to life rather than to work? And I think it's really hard because the whole culture is in the, well, I mean, I don't think every culture is like that, but the most of the cultures that we live in in Western Europe are like that, of real productivity. How long did that decision take you to manage to like, quit Lan Kelly, move and, and do everything else? Because to the point you're making right now, that's that's not easy. Like, to think about to life rather than everything else. Like it's so it's like, well, I've got bills to pay, I've got kids to look after, all of the if that come after that. Then to go to you know what, let's what does it mean to to life? That's a complete mindset shift that is not easy to to land at. So what was that process like? for you how long did it take you what were some of the other objections or obstacles or fears that came to mind and how did you kind of work on that i mean it was terrifying terrifying it was truly terrifying it's like what am i doing i'm leaving a stable job that i love and i'm at that point i was the only breadwinner so i was like oh my god this is the most miraculous thing i think i've ever done and i was like wait maybe it's more reckless to stay in something that you think it's time to move on from. Like there were a load of really good reasons for me to resign and to leave. And um, and so I was like, I'm just going to have to trust. I'm going to have to trust this is going to be okay. And it's been more than okay. It's been amazing. Um, but it, it took a really, I did this incredible workshop called the money workshop, which is about the money and the life path. And I think it was just the final step I needed to feel the confidence to to find my own way. And then I've just had to be really generous with myself over this past 18 months of stumbling and making mistakes and going, oh, you got a bit too caught up back again in this hustle and stuff. And that's not that's not the life you want. doesn't mean it's a wrong life for other people. It's just not the life I want right now. I want to be able to do my improv comedy. I want to be able to have leisurely mansions. I want to be spacious. It is. I'm curious from that, do you then have a checklist that you're constantly going back to where you're like, am I, am I life in, am I doing this and this and this, or am I falling back into, let's call it the rat race, or is that just an internal checklist that you have? I have a, I have a joy barometer, no pay, which I didn't quite realize a that I've been joy barometer. <laughs> I'm like, is this going to bring me pleasure and joy? <laughs> uh, do I have to do this? Okay, if I have to do this, how do I do this in a way that brings me pleasure and joy? What well, what does that mean I'm not going to do? How do I do this? And if it feels really like efforting, like am I really trying too hard for this, then maybe that's not right. Maybe that will come back in a few years and it will be ready for that. So I do have certain things and I was like oh I'm feeling really like this again oh okay wait a minute I've come off compass so I, I think I've finally understood what it means to live with a purpose because my purpose is pleasure and joy <laughs> which feels such a luxurious purpose to have but I think there is a form of activism in it as well because I think it's quite countercultural to to how you should live I think lots of stuff is sold to people on people's pain or hurt and to say, no, I'm going to foreground the other side of that. Just, it just feels, it feels like activism. Uh, Adrian Marie Brown has written a book, Pleasure is Activism. And I was like, oh yes, maybe it is. Maybe it's just a different form of this stuff that I've always thought about. Different approach. Definitely are living, but living for you and your family rather than living for what the world thinks that you should it should be you should do how you should act um or how about that to put it like leading from the inside rather than from the outside in is is a form of activism because it's very very radical so it's a very different approach which is good i think we need we need more or any more radical thinking and radical approaches because things definitely ain't working right now with everyone going to status quo so i'm definitely here for it and 
you mentioned improv. Why? Like, imp- improv is, like, honestly, one of the hardest, <laughs> one of the hardest things ever. There ain't no, there ain't no pleasure and joy in improv. No, I tell you why, because I went to do it because I realized I'd forgotten how to laugh. Like, coming out of the pandemic, you know, everyone is really stressed, they're really tired, they're all of this stuff, and I realized I'd forgotten how to laugh. Like, truly, belly laugh, laugh. It's like, okay. And then my friend said, why don't you come to improv? And I went, well, I've always thought about improv, but it terrifies me. So let me just do it. So I did it. And I was literally... I literally froze for the first five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten (laughs) sessions. But, but it wasn't me, and I was just there, and I wasn't worrying about how I looked. I just laughed. I laughed so much, and every session I left, I felt really good. And it was teaching me playfulness, creativity, how to really, like, really let yourself think in a way that wasn't. And I realised I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm never going to be, it's never going to be a profession. I have performed live, but no one would ever knows that I perform live because this is entirely for me. It's for no one else. No one else is ever going to need to have any judgment about it because I'm up there doing it because it really brings me pleasure and joy. So that's why. But it, if I pause to think about it, it terrifies me. And I really enjoy it. <laughs> when I pause and think about it, it just terrifies me. So I am with you on that one. But I love the way when you say like, well, I'm going to stop thinking about it. When you stop thinking about yourself, you can really just connect with yourself in the sense of really, really laughing. That self-conscious look and feel just goes away, goes out the window. But it took you 10, you said it took you what, five to 10 sessions just to be able to do that. Just let go of that. And you kept on going. Yeah, because... It just didn't, apart after the first couple, I was like, oh, this has got something for me. This, this is, this is giving me something. I mean, I'm terrible at it. I'll never make a career in it. But I was like, when do you as an adult get to be truly silly? And truly, truly silly with other people in service of being silly. Like, silly, funny, silly, not ridiculous silly and everyone who you're doing improv with is wanting you to be the best like they literally like it's what you're taught is you go up there and you yes and your partner because you want to build on everything you build you build you build so you're doing it in community with other people who want you to succeed which is amazing now am i selling it to you i'm i'm cheering you on (laughs) i'm clapping for you i'm like yes alice you (laughs) Go for it. <laughs> As for me, no. But to be honest, like, I'm thinking about it. I've learned, actually, there's something about that. Or ask myself the question: like, when was the last time you just completely let go and really, really didn't didn't care? And then I think that's when I'm in my family, and when I'm with them, when I'm with my wife, when my kids and stuff like that. Like, I'm like, Mars, like you really are ridiculously. You're so silly. And it's like. But no one ever sees that side of you, apart from like a couple of my friends. But that's the only time I just completely let go. There's no, there's no judgment. There's no, there's nothing. But outside of that, no, it's just, it's still, there's still, uh, I guess there's an armor in a sense that you use to protect yourself. But then I guess the armor, you can protect yourself in one hand, it can also limit you in the other hand. So all the like just to have that be in that environment, be completely free and just let go of everything. I don't know. It is, it is fascinating, but I don't think I'm there yet. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that enlightened just yet. (laughs) For the whole of my life thought, how do I become this person who doesn't just share, (laughs) who is mysterious, who is professional, who has this armor. And I'm like, I just, I don't know if I can manage that. And I had to really make my peace with it a few years ago and I went down just gonna be this like oh i just am i can't i can't change this bit i just have to like it <laughs> i would love to, i would love to have a bit of armor i don't know if that would be a bit improv 
Och vi tänkte lära dig vad jag är. Vi ska ha som. I'm gonna find you an improv course near you and send it uh, to you. I might even book you on it as a gift. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be there and be very stoic. I just be. It's, it's good. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> no chance. You can't hide that. But you know what? So many of the tools that they use at the start of improv are incredibly similar to the tools we use in leadership development and leadership practices they're really similar like the yes and principle of building on it and some of these other ways of getting into your body or dealing with the uncertainty or complexity like it it really does tie to so some of the stuff that we work on your practice obviously you don't pull it out and say there's an improv technique but do you ever pull it out in that then i mean if I was really conscious and intentional and really thought about it, I would say, yeah, but I do it this way, this way. But I think what I've done is I've merged it into other bits of practice. And I think I think really where it's helped me is more in how I then am with other people so I can be much freer in my gestures or my movement. When they're using their movement and their gestures, so I, I worry less about how I am. So I think that's really how I've incorporated it. Because I'm not there for myself, I'm there for them. So it really helps me in that way. So are you always, because someone is very intentional about joy and, and pleasure, how often do you go through moments and times when you also feel down and sad and angry and out? And how long do you allow yourself to stay in that space? I, do you know, it's a really, it's a really good question. And people ask me all the time because I think they're intrinsically linked. Like they are, you can't have pleasure and joy if you don't experience pain and sorrow because you have to have both ends of the spectrum. And I, I, I think I feel, I sometimes think I rent a crier for a TV program because I will cry at almost anything on the TV program or. I'll feel the pain and the sadness and that other people are feeling, or I will feel it myself. And if I'm angry, I will just let myself be angry for five or 10 minutes and I'll amplify the anger so I can get it out, work out what it's really telling me and then move on. So I, I think it's, you have to have all of these. It's just about expanding my range and shifting my focus to look on pleasure and joy more than to look at all the hurt, the pain and the suffering. But they, they are best buddies, really, those things, I think, in some ways. One of the things that can bring a lot of pleasure and joy, but also reduce it sometimes, is parenting. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like, you've got two, two beautiful kids. All right. What are some, some of the lessons you've learned around that when it comes to when you think about pleasure, joy, and so you talked about the anger, the pain, and frustration? How do you then bring that emotion up with your parenting style, parenting approach? Well, I mean, I would love to say I was like going to be in line for parenting awards, but I don't think I am. I think it brings out the worst in me and brings out the best in me, like it does with most parents. But I think one of the things that's really bought me recently, especially with improv, is letting go of control. Especially because they're transitioning to teenagers. And I'm like, oh my God, I think I was a real control freak around some of these aspects of parenting. Now I have to let go. And then, uh, and then one of my daughters is quite quiet and quite introverted. And as you can see, I probably not Seriously, that. no, I couldn't, I couldn't tell. <laughs> I thought you were deeply into red. What? <laughs> <laughs> so she's, she's really quiet and contemplative. So... So I've had to really think that's my definition of pleasure and joy, but what's her definition of pleasure and joy? And how do I meet her where she is with that rather than expecting her to come and meet me where I am? And how do I do that? So I'm discovering just the simplicity of some of the things of just being quiet and still with her is also really pleasurable and joyful. So I think I think they are the mirror to your to your worst aspects as a human and to your best aspects as a human. I mean, it's not best and worst, is it? It's just some of the shadow sides of who you are. But yeah, I think my parenting style is in flux right now. But that's not all, though. I don't. 
I think to that point, it like your parenting style never stays the same because your kids are also growing. So it has to be continuously growing and adapting. And to your point, it's bringing out the, the different the different shadow sides. Where it's like, okay, yeah, I showed up great. I can handle that. Oh, it's brought this side of me. That's linked to how I was like, okay, I need to unlearn that. I relearn anywhere. So it's that constant motion. And that's why I always, I always say that parenting is one of those areas where it's a, it's a training ground. Like you learn so much about yourself because your kid pull it out from you. <laughs> on a regular basis. And, uh, sometimes I think it'd be really nice not to be in that training ground. <laughs> but I'm also having to learn how to parent in a different culture because I wanted my kids to experience what it was. One of the reasons we moved here in terms of was I wanted my kids to experience what it felt like to be other. Because, you know, we're white and they would never truly experience it. And then we've got here and I'm having to learn how to parent in a different culture. And what I might think is a Brit is acceptable is not acceptable here in the Netherlands. They're much freer. So I'm having to let go. So so it's also really interesting in terms of learning how to shape shift, I think. And what is really important to me and what can I let go of? What's the move like, been like for you, personally? I mean, sometimes I'd really not like to have that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but I realise that's a choice I can make. It is been really confronting at times, and it's been really amazing at other times. Like here, you see a six or seven year old child going down to the supermarket with their parents' card to buy stuff from the supermarket, and it's really normal. And you, and, they, and you, just the other adults will watch out for them, or like. Yeah, that, that my daughter's cycle to school from 10 and you just have to let that kind of freedom to explore happen in a different way than you would in the UK. And playgrounds don't have school playgrounds here. The only school that has a fence around its playground is the British private school. Everything else just has its playground open. There's no fences. Wow, that's, that's big volumes. And and the children don't run off. They just don't run off. So I'm like, oh my God, this is really, like, I can see your face. It really has to make you question something as someone who comes with the sort of British more fear base. <laughs> when you say okay like that, Chopin, I know there's something you're thinking. What are you thinking? No, I'm, I'm thinking around actually the, something we've talked about today around, what would it be like to have that? freeness and that openness and that way of thinking from such a young age but how does that even help an individual a human being show up differently as to how we've been how we've grown up in the uk for example like and how much of how much has our society really confined us without really thinking about it until you go to someone like where you are right now. That's kind of what some of the the thoughts percolate in my mind, but that's where I tend to go deep in stuff. So I'll think about that probably afterwards. <laughs> but that's what I was like, that's, that's really interesting. I'm so, I'm curious, I'm, lo- I'm curious about it to be honest. Yeah, I'm still curious about it four and a half years in Japan and I'm still trying to learn it. <laughs> um, well, as we come to what I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, how do you define leadership? Yeah, I don't, and that's such a good question. I guess my first instinct is to go, leadership is about modelling something that you would like others to do and to try and creating the, that kind of inspiration for people to want to do that and to try it, I guess. And then I think there were for me, leadership is also about having elements of bravery or trust that you can you can try something and you can you can lead that, and then creating the opportunities for others to really succeed and do their best. I think would be my knee jerk response, but I think I would. The moment I get off this, <laughs> I'm going to go. I should have said that. Well, I think I think it really differs. I did a leadership course with the police. I was training with the police, so they have like a real command and control 
thing because they're dealing with emergencies where it's life or death. Like leadership there is about making really decisive decisions and making sure everyone knows what they're doing and getting on with it. Leadership with the stuff I'm thinking about is creating the space it's for cool. others. To, to I, I like the knee jerk response. It's the it's the raw, unfiltered, unthought about. It's front of mind for me response to that question, and that's why I like it. You know, that's that like improv. You don't have to go put you on the spot. You gotta <laughs> you gotta lean into it. Let's see, let's see what comes out. That's my version of the improv. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, where is the policeman inside of me that wants to have their command and control? I I did this leadership course with the police, which was all about collaboration with someone who was from the Royal Military Police. And literally, he couldn't understand me. He was like, "What are you talking about? Why would you do that? Why would you ask people their opinions?" And but yeah, because you're only thinking about your leadership uh -huh. in one context. There are different contexts. And my last question to you then be, what is the ultimate, what would the ultimate joy, pleasure moment be for you in this, let's call it the next 40 years chapter of your life? What are you working towards? I mean, if I was to really have the ultimate, I mean, I think I would just laugh every day and be surrounded by friends and family. And I would swim in wild water every single day. I would literally probably have a house at the bottom of the water because I would just be able to be a fish. And there would be sun. There's definitely sun. There's not rain and cold like there is right now. Yeah, so that would be it. I would just be able to just have that and know that I was having that whilst everyone else was having it. Oh, now this, this, has, this has been a pleasure. It's been insightful. Um, I have laughed a lot, but one thing that I always say about Alice, anytime you run Alice, her infectious nature is going to get to you. Um, the willingness to live life on her own terms and to make an impact in the lives of other people is, is strong. And, um, yeah, so I, I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on. Oh, uh, she didn't know what I said. The conversation wasn't planned. She didn't know what it was going to be like. Well, she's like, let me lead into it. And it's, it's been a couple of curveballs in there, but you've survived. You've done a really good job, so you should be proud of yourself. But it's just training. It's training for your podcast. It's what it's going to be like. So, yeah. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming on. This is Everyday Leadership. See you next week.